Linda McCarty was the wife of famous Beatle Paul McCartney. Even though her life was tragically cut short, she made remarkable strides in photography, music, and activism. So let's take a look at her life and see her legacy. Early Life Linda Louise Eastman entered the world on September 24, 1941, right in the heart of Scarsdale, New York. She wasn't an only child. Linda grew up in a bustling household with three siblings, basking in the glow of a wealthy and artistic upbringing. Her mom, Louise Linder Eastman, hailed from a family loaded with riches, thanks to the Linder department store chain. Her dad, Lee V. Eastman, was a Harvard-bound prodigy who crafted his own success story as a showbiz lawyer, rubbing elbows with legends like Hopalong Cassidy and Willem de Kooning. Composer Jack Lawrence even wrote a hit song named after Linda when she was just a sprightly six-year-old. No big deal, right? Well, it was a pretty big deal when Buddy Clark sang it in 1947, and later when Perry Como and Jan and Dean put their own spin on it. However, Linda wasn't just a music muse, she was also an animal whisperer. Even as a child, she was the neighborhood hero, nursing injured squirrels and birds back to health like a real-life Disney princess. After attending high school at Scarsdale High, Linda jetted off to the University of Arizona, diving headfirst into the world of art history. Unfortunately, her college days took a somber turn when tragedy struck. Her mom tragically perished in the 1962 American Airlines Flight 1 crash. In the wake of this devastating loss, Linda decided to abandon her studies and tie the knot with Joseph Melville C. Jr. in June 1962. Their daughter Heather entered the world just six months later, bringing a ray of sunshine into their lives. Alas, love doesn't always conquer all. The couple's diverging paths led to a split in June 1965. He was all about academia and research, while Linda yearned for the cozy comforts of home. Despite the heartache, Linda found solace in the sprawling landscapes of Arizona, galloping through the desert on horseback like a Wild West heroine. Linda, surrounded by the towering saguaro cacti of the Arizona desert, felt like she'd stepped right into the set of a classic western. The rugged beauty of the landscape sparked something inside her, a passion for photography. Photography Her journey into the world of photography began when her friend Hazel Archer introduced her to the art form. Suddenly, Linda saw the world through a new lens. She once said that photography made her a different person because it was something she loved doing and just nothing else mattered. With no formal training, she dove in head first, learning through trial and error. Her first taste of success came unexpectedly when a Shakespearean actor visiting Tucson asked her to snap a publicity still. That simple request led to her first published photo, featured in the prestigious British Actors Directory, Spotlight. Despite only attending two photography lessons at night school while pursuing her art history degree, Linda was deeply inspired by the works of photography legends like Walker Evans, Dorothea Lange, and Edward Weston. She even paid homage to early photographic pioneer William Henry Fox by crafting handcrafted cyanotype prints. Throughout her career, Linda dabbled in various printing processes and became a master of Polaroid photography, producing thousands of captivating snapshots. However, it was her fearless attitude that truly set her apart. At this point, she moved to New York with her daughter and found some work. While working as an editorial receptionist at Town & Country magazine, Linda seized an opportunity that would change her life. Armed with an unwanted invitation to a Rolling Stones promotional party on the steamship Sea Panther, she crashed the event and captured iconic photographs of the band. Despite attempts to bar photographers from the yacht, Linda's determination and the Stones' amusement at her boldness won them over, securing her a spot among the stars. Linda McCartney was not just another member of the press, but a rock and roll enthusiast armed with a camera and a keen eye for capturing candid moments. While most journalists would be scrambling for quotes, Linda was busy snapping shots of the band at their most laid back and unguarded. Reflecting on her experience, Linda revealed that she was a bit shy and introverted, but looking out through the lens, she could actually see life. This enthusiasm came rushing out and photography changed her life. With her newfound passion, Linda soon became the go-to photographer for capturing the essence of 60s icons, from Jimi Hendrix to Twiggy. As the sole photographer on the boat, Linda held the golden ticket. 
Journalists begged her for her photos to accompany their stories, forging valuable connections along the way. So she did what any aspiring artist would do. She bid farewell to her job and dove headfirst into the world of photography. Fortunately, her talents shone through. Linda's candid, intimate snapshots of the Rolling Stones caught the eye of magazines far and wide, earning her a spot in editorial features and kick-starting her career as a professional photographer. Now, Linda's father had high hopes for her to undergo formal training with a seasoned professional. Linda had other plans, though. She said that she never had the patience for formal training and preferred learning on the job, so she had to trust her gut on that. With her camera in hand, Linda embarked on a journey through the heart of the 60s musical revolution. From the iconic Fillmore East in New York City to the electric vibes of live performances, Linda captured it all. The Rolling Stones, Otis Redding, Jimi Hendrix, you name it, she shot it. Surprisingly, her work didn't just feature in the pages of magazines, it made history. Linda captured a remarkable photo of Eric Clapton, which ended up on the cover of Rolling Stone magazine's May 11, 1968 issue. This made her the first female photographer to achieve such a thing. Australian rock critic Lillian Roxon started using Linda's photos in her Sydney Morning Herald column. Linda also took cool pics for The Blues Project, a rock band, and was soon earning a good paycheck. Her photos of the British supergroup Cream made it into the first Rolling Stone magazine. She kept snapping shots of rock legends before they were huge, like Bob Dylan, The Doors, Janis Joplin, Simon and Garfunkel, Frank Zappa, and Jimi Hendrix. Not many rock photographers have such an amazing collection of 60s stars photos, often taken right at the start of their careers. Linda always went for natural light instead of flash. This made her portraits feel up close and personal. Her work was gathered in a book in 1992 titled Linda McCartney's 60s Portrait of an Era. Linda's knack for capturing the Rolling Stones led to more gigs from different magazines eager to show off the music scene of the 60s. New York City was where it was at, buzzing with young people leading art, music, and fashion revolutions, not to forget the psychedelic drugs and new views on love. Both rising and famous bands wanted Linda to take their pictures for tours because she was talented at catching candid moments. It made everyone feel like they were hanging out with the stars, not just admiring them from afar. In 1967, by the time Linda was already named the United States Female Photographer of the Year, she went to London to capture the swinging 60s. It would be there where she'd meet her husband Paul McCartney. Meeting Paul McCartney Linda Eastman's love story with Beatles heartthrob Paul McCartney kicked off in 1967 at a Georgie Fame concert in London's Bag O'Nails nightclub. Linda was in England for work, snapping photos of musicians for a book titled Rock and Other Four-Letter Words. The two had made eye contact before at the club, but Paul was determined to get her attention for real. Now, here's where the magic happens. As Linda was making her way out, she passed by their table, Paul caught sight of her and decided he wasn't about to let her slip away. He stood up, blocked her exit, flashed his signature grin, and asked her if she would join him at the next club they were going to. Paul knew there was a slim chance of this actually working, but guess what? This move worked. After their first encounter, Linda went back to the States to handle business and take care of her daughter. Meanwhile, Paul found himself tangled up in a brief engagement with his girlfriend, Jane Asher. It didn't last long, and they went their separate ways. Fast forward to a year later, the Beatles touched down in New York, and guess who Paul runs into? Yep, it was Linda again. Things got serious when Linda and her daughter Heather flew across the pond to London, and she and Paul officially started seeing each other. Paul even invited Linda to hang out at his place, and let's just say, it was a night to remember. Fans camped outside his house reported that Paul seemed downright ecstatic that evening. He was so happy that he was perched on the windowsill, strumming his acoustic guitar, playing the timeless melody of Blackbird from his upstairs room for his fans below. Now, McCartney wasn't just smitten with Eastman for no reason. Nope. He had a laundry list of reasons why he was head over heels. As he put it later, he liked her as a woman. For him, she was good-looking with a good figure so physically he was attracted to her. However, it wasn't just about looks. McCartney was drawn to her fierce independence Linda had quite a rebellious streak. She wasn't one for socializing, 
She'd rather hang out in the kitchen with the maids, picking up cooking tips. Furthermore, when it came to education, she wasn't exactly the teacher's pet, but that was just fine by Paul. He admired her as an artist, someone who danced to the beat of her own drum, even if it meant being the black sheep of the family. Now, Linda's daughter, Heather, played a huge role in bringing them closer together. Paul had always dreamed of having kids of his own, and meeting Heather, who was almost six at the time, sealed the deal. He practically begged Linda to move to London with him, and when they did, he made sure to shower Heather with love and attention. From bedtime stories to cartoon drawing sessions, Paul was the doting dad he always wanted to be. Biographer Philip Norman noticed something special about Linda, too. She wasn't hung up on appearances or dressing to impress, nope. She was all about keeping it casual, even at fancy events. Plus, whenever they were out together, she'd cling to his arm, gazing up at him with starry eyes like he was her personal idol. Because of this relationship, Paul, once the epitome of polished perfection, starts embracing a more laid-back vibe. Suddenly, he's skipping the daily shave and opting for simpler clothes. His maid even remarked that he could hop on a bus to Apple without raising any eyebrows. However, it wasn't just Paul's appearance that underwent a transformation. Linda's easygoing outlook on life started rubbing off on him, too. He recalls a moment when, feeling utterly exhausted from work, he mustered up the courage to apologize to her for showing signs of fatigue. You know what she said? She simply said that it's allowed. Cue Paul's mind being blown. This genuinely shook him to his core. He'd never been with anyone who thought like that because normally he'd have to pretend to be still full of energy. This was the first time it became clear to him that he was allowed to be tired. Her relationship with Paul McCartney When Linda made the move to London, she became an instant target for the paparazzi and die-hard Beatles fans alike. The front of her residence soon became a canvas for graffiti, with some writings calling her as one of the wild things. Despite the backlash, the lovebirds tied the knot in 1969 in a ceremony that felt more like a funeral for the last remaining Bachelor Beetle. Not everyone was thrilled about the union, though. British fans in particular were less than impressed, seeing Linda as the reason for ending McCartney's solo Bachelor status. John Lennon's marriage to Yoko Ono just a week later only added fuel to the fire. Lennon himself came to Linda's defense, slamming the press for their relentless attacks on her. He said that Linda got the same kind of insults and hatred thrown at her for no reason whatsoever other than she fell in love with Paul McCartney. As the big day approached, tensions ran high. In fact, the night before the wedding, Paul and Linda had a major blowout, leaving them on the brink of calling off the whole event. Luckily, love prevailed, and they said, I do anyway, with Linda donning a trench coat to discreetly hide her pregnancy bump. After all, they had a future together, one that would soon include not just one, but three bundles of joy, Mary, Stella, and James. Their marriage, though, wasn't all sunshine and rainbows. Paul McCartney has shared that they went through a lot of highs and lows, far from what you'd think was 25 years of pure happiness. He was proud to say that in their 29 years together, they were almost never apart, except for a few nights. That was only because of a time Paul got arrested at a Tokyo airport for having drugs. Not long after they got married, trouble started brewing. By the end of 1969, the Beatles were talking about splitting up. This hit McCartney hard, and he found himself drowning in sadness and anger, drinking way too much, mad at himself and everyone else. He had a tough time. He wouldn't even get out of bed and stop taking care of himself. Smoking marijuana was the only thing that helped him calm down something both he and Linda liked a lot. Linda remembered a time when Paul was feeling really down. He requested her help, asking her to take the weight off his shoulders. Linda was surprised to hear this and reassured Paul by saying that he was already on top of the world by being one of the Beatles. Linda was the one who pulled Paul out of his forlorn state and introduced him to the therapeutic nature of music. After a rough few months, Paul McCartney wrote the song, Maybe I'm Amazed for Linda saying it was their own song, especially as the Beatles were breaking up. Then came Wings, in 1971, a new band with Paul as the lead singer and Linda on keyboards. Linda was nervous about how people would react to her, especially being known as Paul's wife, but it turned out she didn't have to worry. 
People really took a liking to her. What was funny, though, is that the former Beatle would contemplate whether to hit the stage solo after realizing that his wife isn't exactly the musical type. Yep. According to Paul, Linda couldn't strum a chord to save her life. So Paul toyed with the idea of leaving her behind for gigs more than once. However, her companionship and knack for keeping him grounded on those whirlwind international tours were just too essential to pass up. Now, while all this musical mayhem was happening, the McCartneys decided to ditch the London hustle and bustle and opt for a more laid-back lifestyle on a farm in Scotland. Surrounded by many animals, Linda's personal heaven, they found solace in the simple life. During their time at the Scottish farm, the McCartneys became poster children for the vegetarian lifestyle, smashing stereotypes left and right. They even launched a food company that raked in millions. Speaking of Scotland, it wasn't just a getaway spot for them, it was their sanctuary. Away from the crowds and noise of the city, they found solace in nature's embrace. Paul would reminisce about how they would kick back and soak in the beauty of their surroundings. Even the song, Two of Us, from Let It Be, was born out of their countryside escapades, a love letter to their blissful retreat from the world. For Linda, Scotland was more than just a place. It was a refuge from the chaos of the music business, a slice of paradise at the end of the world. Plus, as she described it, it was a feeling of civilization melting away, leaving nothing but pure, unadulterated bliss. These were the golden years, the peak of bliss for Paul and Linda McCartney, according to none other than Barry Miles, a close friend and confidant. He said that he'd never seen a more affectionate pair. They were always gushing about their love for each other, the lows of their relationship. As nice as this sounds, don't let the serene setting fool you. Behind closed doors, their marriage was anything but a fairy tale. In a 1985 interview, Paul admitted that their relationship looked very peachy from the outside, but that wasn't the case underneath the surface. Their relationship was volatile, to say the least. At the moment of the interview, though, Paul did hope for their relationship to last the test of time despite the volatility. The seemingly flawless facade of their nearly three-decade-long union has faced scrutiny from those closest to the couple. Linda had her moments of deep sadness and despair about their marriage. There were times when the thought of walking away crossed her mind, but she nipped it in the bud immediately. Family was everything to her, and she wasn't about to abandon ship. All this came from Peter Cox, a writer of vegetarian cookbooks and a keeper of Linda's most intimate thoughts in audio diaries. Between 1987 and 1989, amidst whipping up recipes for a cookbook that would cement Linda as the queen of vegetarianism, Cox bore witness to their clashes. According to him, these spats were often instigated by Paul himself, whom Cox describes as super controlling, with a bit of a dark side. Many a time, Linda would confide in Cox through tear-streaked cheeks. She'd urge Cox to come work on the book only when Paul was away. Whenever Paul swooped in, it was like he cast a spell over everything. He was so controlling that they couldn't get any work done. His word was gospel, and no one else's mattered. So, they would pause on work until Paul made his grand exit. Interestingly, Paul put a stop to those audio diaries from being released in 2006. This was in the middle of his divorce hearings with his second wife, Heather Mills, who accused him of less than stellar treatment. Paul had to pay £200,000 to get a hold of these tapes. This is roughly $300,000 today. Amidst the rocky marital woes, Cox maintains one thing. Linda was Paul's rock, his guiding light, even in the roughest of times. In 1997, Linda ascended to nobility, becoming Lady McCartney when her husband Paul was bestowed with knighthood. Their bond endured until tragedy struck, and Linda's life was cut short in 1998. Her brother, the entertainment law guru John Eastman, had been Paul's legal guardian since the Beatles disbanded, a role he held until his passing in 2020. Career continued. However, Linda's journey didn't end with matrimony. Oh no, she was just getting started. After getting her name on the credits of Paul's solo album, Ram, Linda stepped onto the stage alongside her husband, lending her voice to Wings. Between gigs, she chronicled their adventures and family escapades, both under the spotlight and behind the scenes. Then came 1997, 
and a new musical venture emerged on the horizon, Susie and the Red Stripes. It was the same as Wings, but it was incognito, operating under a different moniker. With this undercover experiment, Linda proved she wasn't just riding on Paul's coattails. She was a force to be reckoned with, deserving of the public's attention in her own right. She even penned and sang her own songs, like the groovy Seaside Woman, released in 1977 via Epic Records in the United States. Also, let's not forget her stint in the animation industry. Linda's musical magic graced the airwaves in the form of Oriental Nightfish, a cartoon extravaganza that earned nods of approval at the Cannes Film Festival. The couple also received an Oscar for the James Bond anthem, Live and Let Die. The wings soared high, but even their wingspan couldn't shield them from tragedy. After Lennon's heartbreaking demise, Paul was devastated, his creative spirit dampened. So in 1981, the curtains fell on the wings era. While Paul was going through a slump, Linda remained a force to be reckoned with in the music world. She continued her solo journey, dropping albums and singles. Her swan song, Light From Within, featured prominently in her 1998 posthumous release, Wide Prairie. In 1975, when she and Paul made the switch to vegetarianism, Linda declared she'd given up eating anything with a face, famously saying that if slaughterhouses had glass walls, the whole world would be vegetarian. This bold move birthed a new era of culinary creativity, spawning cookbooks and even a company. Linda didn't stop there. In 1989, she went on a mission to spread the benefits of vegetarianism. In this process, she penned her first two best-selling cookbooks, Linda McCartney's Home Cooking and Linda's Kitchen. After tasting culinary success, Linda ventured into uncharted territory in 1991, launching her own line of ready-to-eat meat-free meals. What started with a modest selection of six dishes blossomed into a robust list of over 40 products, and the Linda McCartney Foods range continues to thrive today. However, Linda wasn't just about food. Her photography wielded power, and she used this for good. She captured images that supported many causes, from the anti-fur movement to environmental activism. She lent her support to many organizations, including Greenpeace, Friends of the Earth, and the British Dyslexia Association. In 1998, Linda stepped up once again. She aided cancer charity Backup and the Starlight Foundation. She channeled the proceeds from her sponsorship of the world's first all-vegetarian professional cycling team to these noble causes. Her creative endeavors even led her to cinema. Her track Seaside Woman was immortalized in a Cannes Film Festival-winning cartoon directed by Oscar Grillo in 1980. Furthermore, Linda's photographs of the Grateful Dead blossomed into Grateful Dead, a photo film. This was a groundbreaking project melding still photography with motion, a brainchild directed by none other than Paul McCartney himself. This unique blend of visuals earned a nod of respect, earning entries into the prestigious London and New York film festivals. Building on her success in the animation industry with previous shorts like Seaside Woman and Oriental Nightfish, Linda ventured into another animated endeavor, Wide Prairie, which premiered in 1998. Linda's creative journey didn't stop there. She was a remarkable photographer. She captured the essence of family life, nature's beauty, and the rich human experience. Her photographs found homes in prestigious galleries across the globe, including the National Portrait Galleries of the United Kingdom and the U.S. Notably, Linda stands as the sole photographer to boast three solo exhibitions at the esteemed Royal Photographic Society in Bath. In a moving tribute, the University of Arizona posthumously awarded Linda an honorary doctorate in fine arts in 2023. Yet, amid her multifaceted career as a visual artist, animal rights activist, culinary connoisseur, musician, and vegetarian icon, Linda knew what her profound achievement was, her four children with Paul, Heather, Mary, Stella, and James. For the McCartneys, though, tragedy was looming on the horizon. Death. Sadly, Linda's life was cut short by breast cancer, a battle that began in 1995 and ultimately metastasized to her liver. Paul was hit hard by the grim diagnosis. He recalled a private conversation he had with the doctors. They had told him that they diagnosed the issue far too late. They couldn't do anything to save her. 
She only had about 18 months left to live. That was it. On April 17, 1998, Linda breathed her last at the McCartney family ranch in Tucson, Arizona, surrounded by her loved ones. Paul tenderly shared in a statement that the kids and him were there when she passed away. As the final moments with Linda unfolded, each member of her family took turns expressing their love for her. Then Paul softly whispered a picturesque scene, saying that she's on her beautiful Appaloosa stallion on a fine spring day with a clear blue sky. Paul barely reached the end of the sentence before Linda closed her eyes and gently slipped away. In accordance with her wishes, Linda was cremated in Tucson, and her ashes were scattered across the McCartney family's idyllic English farm in Sussex. Paul urged fans to honor her memory by supporting breast cancer research charities that abstain from animal testing, or better yet, by embracing a vegetarian lifestyle. A touching memorial service took place at St. Martin in the Fields in London, drawing a congregation of 700. This included stars like George Harrison, Ringo Starr, Billy Joel, Elton John, David Gilmour, Peter Gabriel, and others. A second memorial service followed at Riverside Church in Manhattan, further emphasizing Linda's profound impact on those whose lives she touched. Paul tenderly expressed at her funeral that Linda was his girlfriend and that he had sadly lost his girlfriend. After her passing, Paul inherited all of Linda's property, including royalties from her creative endeavors. He pledged to uphold her legacy by continuing her line of vegetarian food products, ensuring they remain free from genetically modified organisms. The grief of losing Linda weighed heavily on Paul, as he openly shared that he cried to the point where it was almost embarrassing. With time, however, he found joy in treasured memories of their life together. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next video.